Hi everybody, um, welcome to the second class in the introduction to methodology. Uh, today we're going to be looking a little bit more specifically um, at different designs, focusing uh, most on uh, kind of the causal level, since uh, ideally we, we would like to be uh, explaining things. Um, so focusing most on the designs and um, how they fit with being able to make causal claims, um, but also looking at designs that uh, do both uh, find both relationships or merely uh, descriptive. Uh, and we'll go more in depth on some of them uh, later in the course, particularly we'll talk more about uh, survey type designs uh, later on since that's what we're going to be doing, uh, but this is just a little bit more of a, a general overview. All right, so here are um, some of the sources that we used in putting together today's lecture in, in case uh, you're interested. All right, so we're going to start with the discussion of internal validity. So yesterday uh, we uh, introduced internal validity as the approximate truth um, of inferences regarding cause, effect, or causal relationships. So if we're trying to make a causal claim, um, can we believe that the causal claim that we found or that we've identified um, is in fact a causal relationship? So uh, we, we do a study, we're trying to find cause effect, we think we found cause effect. Um, can we actually believe that um, the uh, cause that we've identified uh, really did produce uh, the effect that we've observed? Um, and so for causal studies um, of all the different forms of validity, this is perhaps uh, the most important. Uh, not to say the others aren't important. If you don't have a uh, construct or uh, 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 conclusion validity, your, your, your causal claims aren't going to work either. Um, but it's definitely uh, for causal studies, the one that we, we probably focus on, on the most. Um, and in many studies, it could be the, the hardest one to satisfy. Um, it's not a, a consideration for descriptive or uh, relational studies um, uh, because uh, uh, in neither descriptive nor relational studies are we trying to make a, a causal claim. Uh, so here's a schematic view of uh, conceptual uh, context for internal validity. So in the study uh, we did, we introduced some program or treatment that we think causes the observation. Right, and we want to find out is it that the cause that we actually uh, put in caused the effect, or is it, is it something else that could have done it? Some alternative cause that was producing what we saw. Um, so, what does causality mean? Uh, so, pertaining to when we're talking about causality or causal, uh, we're saying causal claim, it's pertaining to cause effect relationship. So, if we're saying it's a causal relationship, we're saying that there is a, uh, something that caused something else. Uh, yeah, in causal relationship, cause effect relationship. So how do we identify a causal relationship? So there's three criteria that you need to satisfy in order to identify cause and effect. Um, so the first is correlation. So you have to find that uh, the two variables or the, the variables that are identified, so the cause and the effect, they go together somehow, right? They, they move in some synchronized manner. It could be a positive, negative relationship, whatever. Uh, you have to find temporal precedence. So the cause must come before the effect. And there could be no alternative, a plausible alternative explanation. So you have to identify, or you, uh, you have to eliminate the alternative um, explanations uh, so that you could show that um, it's really your treatment that has the effect. Uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, for example, if you're studying some outcome, it doesn't mean that there's not other things that can possibly cause it to happen. Um, what altern uh, limiting alternative explanation means is that, uh, that in, in your particular study, the effect was produced by the thing that you're saying caused it. So if you manipulate uh, something and you say you give a, a drug um, or, or med new medication, right? There's, uh, and to one group and you don't give medication to another group. You want to make sure that there wasn't some and you find that those who got the medication um, got, you know, uh, were healthier in, after a while than those who uh, didn't get it, suggesting that the medicine worked. Um, by eliminating alternative uh, plausible explanations, you want to make sure that there wasn't some other difference that led to the, the group that got a medicine um, being healthier. Uh, maybe they were also exercising uh, and the other group wasn't. 
And so it wasn't the medicine, it was exercise. Um, or they were getting some alternative treatment at the same time. So it wasn't in the medicine, it was the alternative treatment that led them to be better. So you want to be showing a study that the only thing that could be producing the results that you found is your explanation. So let's talk a little bit more in depth on each. So correlation. So covariation of the cause and effect, a criterion for establishing a causal relationship that holds that the cause and effect must be related or covary. So they, they have to move in some synchronized manner. So the relationship could be positive, so they both go up or go down together, negative or inverse, so as one goes up, the other goes down, or as one goes down, the other goes up, uh, or nonlinear, um, but there can't be no relationship at all. So if, if one moves and the other doesn't move in some predictable manner, then uh, uh, there's no correlation and there can't be causation. Because if they don't move in, in any way, you can't say that one's causing the other one because um, you, you wouldn't know how it's causing it to do nothing predictable, uh, wouldn't make sense. So again, thinking of, of, of a drug uh, or a new medication, right? If you give it, uh, it could lead somebody to get healthier. Um, it could lead somebody to uh, get worse. It could lead somebody to briefly get worse and then get better. Uh, so nonlinear, right? But if there's nothing that happens, uh, then we can't say that the, the drug caused anything. Temporal precedence. Uh, so there's a correlation that exists uh, between the presence of fire trucks and, uh, and the presence of fires. Uh, would it be accurate to say that firefighters go around causing fires? Uh, this, so there is a correlation here, right? Um, and so if we just took correlation as implying causation, then we would, lead, we would be left with that conclusion. Uh, but it's not causal because it violates the concept of temporal precedent. Um, so it's not uh, that uh, firefighters go around causing fires, it's that firefighters show up when there are fires. So you if you get a fire, that causes firefighters to eventually show up to deal with, with, with the fire. Um, so for temporal precedence, you must always be able to establish that the hypothesized cause occurs earlier in time than the effect. So, in, in, you know, in some studies, like in, in an experiment, this is relatively easy. So you give somebody a medicine, you see, do they get better? They took the medicine before the outcome, so it's easy to see, okay, uh, it's not they got better and then they got the medicine. Uh, so it's easier to show that the medicine came before getting better. Um, in the real world, uh, particularly if you're in dealing with non, uh, if you're dealing with observational studies, um, so you're gathering data based on things that have happened. So say you're gathering economic data on uh, unemployment and inflation, right? It actually can be really difficult to, to establish temporal precedence. Is it which one came before the other? Um, so in those cases, um, it can be a little harder to find causation because temporal precedence is a little bit, because they're always ongoing phenomena. Uh, it's, it can be a little bit more difficult to show which one came first. So you've got to be a little bit more careful with that in observational studies. Uh, and then no alternative explanation uh, or plausible alternative explanation, which would be any other cause uh, that could bring about an effect that is different from your hypothesized or manipulated cause, right? So again, the uh, medicine example, if, if uh, the one that got the medicine was also exercising or has also got some other treatment, uh, then uh, that uh, um, that that you know you, you you might still find a relationship, right? You still might find that those who were in the group that got the medicine did better, but it wasn't because of the medicine; it was because of some other cause, and it's one that you didn't manipulate. Uh, and so we want it to be. Uh, uh, we want to be eliminating those. So if another variable can be causing the effect or possibly causing both the cause and the effect, then you've not demonstrated causality. So we need to be able to get rid of, uh, get rid of those. Or you want to either uh, uh, try to design a study where you can eliminate all alternative explanations. So in experiments, control groups are used to minimize the likelihood of other variables causing the effect, since the only difference between the control and treatment groups should be the presence of the treatment, then no other variable 
would be able to cause the observed difference between the outcome of both groups. So should, um, so there are some ways where this can go wrong, but for example, in our, uh, in our drug scenario, right, we uh, would have uh, one group get the medicine, one group not get the medicine. Uh, ideally, as long as uh, these groups are in every other way behaving similarly, just the only difference is one got the medicine, one didn't, then uh, we should be able to eliminate all other possible explanations, right? Because the only difference between the groups becomes the uh, presence of the medicine, the treatment. All right, so there's many different threats to validity. So yesterday we uh, it talked about how um, for each of the different types of validity, there's certain threats that can lead to uh, 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 lead to kind of erroneous conclusions that can lead uh, you to make a false, in this case for internal validity, uh, false causal claims. And so we can divide them into a single group threats, multiple group threats, and social threats. So single group threats, which we're going to go most in depth on, are a threat to internal validity that occurs in a study that uses only a single program or treatment group and no comparison or control, right? So if you just gave a medicine to someone and you didn't have a control group for comparison, uh, so a multiple group design, control, and treatment group eliminates most single group threats to internal validity, assuming random sampling uh, or random assignment. Sorry, and uh, uh, we'll return more to random assignment later. So the first is what's called a history threat. And so uh, a history threat is a threat to internal validity that occurs when some historical event affects your study outcome. So for example, if you're testing a new teaching method, which we're gonna use uh, a lot for these examples, um, if students did better on the test, not because of the teaching method, but because they watched a documentary on a subject on TV, there's a history threat to internal validity. So um, you're, you're trying to find out if does this teaching method work? So you might even give a, a test first, then introduce a new teaching method, and then test them again. And you're trying to see, did they do better? from that first test to that second test. And you're, you're hoping that it's that new teaching method that's causing it. But if the students were also, uh, you know, uh, out watching a documentary about the subject, then it might have been the documentary uh, that caused the effect. Maturation threat. So a threat to validity that it's a result of natural maturation that occurs between a pre and post test measurement. So students take a test, then receive instruction with the new teaching method and take the test again. Students improve on the second test because they have continued learning outside of class between the two tests, or just naturally maturing. Uh, then we have a maturation threat to internal validity. Uh, so they just, you know, we, we, we don't expect that people are always going to be staying the same, but particularly uh, uh, we continue learning and continue evolving throughout our life. Um, so it, it may not be uh, anything to do with the instruction, it may just be natural uh, 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 kind of evolution. Testing threat. So a threat to internal validity that occurs when taking the pretest uh, affects how participants do in a post-test. So a pretest would be, say, a test we do before we put in the, uh, the, the uh, new uh, teaching method because uh, we want to get kind of like a baseline, see how were they doing before they took it. Then we put in this new teaching method and see how much that new teaching method lead to an improvement in their scores. Um, and so we test then afterwards. Uh, so a testing threat it's, uh, occurs when students take a test. So they take the pretest, then they receive instruction with a new teaching method, and then take the test again. And so we're hoping that it's that new teaching method is causing the increase in scores, improvement in scores. But students might also improve on the second test because they learned strategies from taking the test the first time. Um, so uh, if you give most students a test multiple times, um, they're probably gonna improve the second time, right? Because the first time they're a little bit nervous about it, they, they don't know what they're expecting. Uh, they've never seen these questions before. They've never seen, even if the questions change slightly between the two, they've never seen these style of questions before. Um, the second time they do it, they're going to be less nervous about it, probably. They're going to have learned some strategies about how to uh, handle these uh, questions. They're going to be less surprised. And so they might just do better. And it has nothing to do with the teaching method. It, it has to do with um, they've seen this test before, or they've seen these types of questions before. And so uh, just the fact of 
testing the same person multiple times leads to a change in an outcome. You could also see this, for example, if say the, uh, rather than a school test, think of say the measure for something is uh, blood pressure, right? So you uh, um, test somebody's blood pressure, then you give them a blood pressure medicine, and then you see, you know, what did it do to uh, their blood pressure? Uh, it, and you're hoping that it, it brought it down, it reduced it, because it might be a drug for people of high blood pressure. Um, well, it might also be that the first time uh, when they're going into the first time taking their having their blood pressure taken, the person's really, really nervous. Uh, they don't know it's coming yet. Uh, they say they've never have had their blood pressure taken. Um, um, most probably people probably have, but uh, they might be really nervous about the, this is the first time they're coming into a research study. Um, and so they're nervous going in. Um, then uh, the second time they go in, though, they've already met this researcher. They've already had this test before. They know that there's nothing to be nervous about. Um, and so they go in more calm, and so their blood pressure is lower because uh, they're less nervous. So it may be that we see that there's a difference between the tests, not because uh, the blood pressure medicine did anything, but because just that second time testing, they're less nervous because they've been tested before. Instrumentation threat. So a threat to internal validity that arise when the instrument uh, or observers uh, used on the post-test and pre-test differ. So the instrument is what we use to test. So in, for example, if, if in school, the instrument that we'd be using is the physical test that people uh, are, are given. Um, in, in the blood pressure exam, it would be, you know, using that blood pressure, like the, the cuff that you put on and, uh, uh, and, and and do the reading. So that's the instrument you do for getting your results. Um, so it could be that the instrument in some way uh, uh, due to the instrument that you're using um, or something to do with the observer. So the, so the person's recording the observations. So there's a couple of ways, for example, in our test where the instrumentation threat could come in. So for example, students take the test, then they receive instruction with a new teaching method. So all this is the same. Then they take the test again. So instrumentation threat could come in and if, if students improve on the second test because either the tests are uh, of different difficulty or if a different person grades the two tests using different standards, then there's an instrumentation threat to internal validity. So um, you might want to try to avoid the testing threat by giving slightly different tests, right? So they haven't seen the two tests. Uh, uh, now, if the two tests are of equal difficulty, this isn't a problem. But if one test, it turns out, the second test turns out to be easier uh, than the first test. And it's really hard to design two tests that are exact same difficulty. Um, if so, if it turns out that the second test just turns out to be easier, then the improvement in scores has less to do with, may not have to do with the teaching method. It might just have to do with that second test was easier, so anybody would do better. Um, it also could be, so say it's two different uh, people. So one person, uh, one research assistant grades the, the first uh, test, one research assistant grades the, the second test. If the, uh, the person who grades the first test um, is harsher uh, than the person who grades the second test, uh, and particularly in areas where giving part marks, the harshness of the teacher comes into play. Uh, so it's not a multiple choice one, it's an essay exam or a, a, a stats exam where you can get part marks for your calculation. If the person who does the first test is harsher than the second test, it's not that the teaching method necessarily caused the improvement in grades, it's that that second test was just, the examiner or uh, grader was just easier. Uh, so you wanna make sure that your instrumentation uh, implementation, so both in terms of the instrument and the observer who's using uh, the instrument uh, or gathering the observations and, interpret and uh, uh, are doing so in a similar uh, manner. So this is one of, when I first started doing uh, survey experiments, one the, uh, the uh, uh, and, and doing lab experiments in particular, I said with uh, lab experiments uh, with, with students, the uh, I, I worked as a research assistant for uh, different researchers, and one of the big lessons that we always had uh, coming in was how exactly they wanted us delivering the instructions uh, to all the different groups we were meeting. And it was really important that we wanted to try to create the exact same experience 
for each different group that came in. So we wanted to be delivering the instructions, all the different research assistants uh, delivering the instructions the same way. And each time we, I, I give it, I had to make sure that I would deliver it in the same manner to each group. We wanted the same experience for each group so that we, it wasn't that uh, we saw different results in some uh, respondents uh, being caused by, you know, I, I delivered the instructions in a slightly different way than another guy. and. The, the difference in the results becomes because of um, how I delivered the instructions versus how they delivered the instructions. Um, that can be a real problem. So uh, one of the major, uh, major trainings for say delivering uh, lab experiments is in terms of creating a consistent experience for everybody who's participating. Mortality threat. Um, so a threat to validity that occurs because a significant number of participants drop out. Uh, so this can literally mean mortality in case of like say in medical of dying, but that, that's not as much of a threat usually in, in most of the social sciences, uh, physically dying, but it's more of just leaving your study. Uh, so for example, students take a test, uh, then receive instruction with a new teaching method, then take a test again. Um, if students who did poorly on the first test drop out of the class because they're discouraged, uh, and this causes the average grade on the second test to increase, then there's a mortality threat to internal validity, right? So it's not necessarily that uh, 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 it was that the, the test is more um, difficult, uh, or, or, or sorry, it's not necessarily that the teaching method actually did anything, it's that all, all the people who did poorly on the first one left. And so naturally the average is gonna be higher on the second one because you're taking you're taking an average of just be better students. Um, so uh, you're, you always have to be careful if you have people who are dropping out, you uh, um, ideally in a repeated measure, so one where you've got like a pre and post test, uh, you definitely wanna be careful about how many people are dropping out and particularly um, if there's some form of Kind of bias in who's dropping out. So if it was just random students dropping out, and it was you know some of the top, some of the middle students, and some of the weak students dropping out, it wouldn't be as big of a problem. But if you have like just the best students drop out, or just the worst students drop out, uh, then that's going to have an effect on kind of the scores on the second test, and it's going to lead you potentially to bad conclusions about how the teaching method is working. Regression threat. Uh, so this is a statistical phenomenon that causes a group's average performance on one measure to regress towards or appear closer to the mean of that measure than anticipated or predicted. Regression occurs whenever you have a non-random sample from a population and two measures that are imperfectly correlated. Um, a regression threat will bias your estimate of the group's protest performance and can lead to incorrect causal inferences. So I, I know this sounds uh, more complex than some of the other ones, so uh, hopefully the example will help. So uh, students take a test and receive instruction with a new teaching method and take a test again. So similar, same scenario. If students uh, did unusually well, so many lucky guesses on the first test, and then return to their average scores on the second test, normal number of lucky guesses, then there's a regression threat uh, to internal validity. It isn't uh, the teaching method uh, causes a decrease in scores. Um, it's just uh, the results um, of chance. It also might be, say, uh, you take, uh, you want to step, you take uh, the bottom, you, you give a, a test to a whole class, right? And you want to see, um, it's the, um, New teaching method can help the worst students. So 100 students take the first test, you take the bottom 10 students um, and you give them the teaching method and then you test them again. And you see that a lot of them improved. And so you'd want to be concluding, oh, oh it, the, these students, uh, the teaching method worked. But what also might be happening is that some of the students who did the worst on the first exam really were the worst students, right? But um, some of the students um, who, um, I, you know, were in the bottom 10 probably weren't the worst students. Maybe they were just having a really bad day. Maybe you, there's always some element of luck in test two, particularly if it's something like a multiple choice test where, you know, there's some questions you know, uh, some questions you don't know, and some you're kind of have an idea and you're guessing on. 
Uh, and the ones you don't know, you're just fully guessing on. And sometimes you get really lucky with your guesses and sometimes you get really unlucky with your guesses. So you could take the same test uh, five times and your score will be different each of the five times because you might make different guesses and sometimes you're going to do better on the guesses, sometimes you're going to do worse on the guesses. Um, so some of those people who are in the bottom 10 that you selected for the teaching uh, method, right? they just might have had a really, really bad day of guessing. Uh, and so then the second time you do it, they're going to improve uh, their, uh, in terms of how their scores go. Um, so you can solve um, many of these threats by, like we said, by adding a, a second uh, group. Um, now, there are still some threats to validity that exist um, if you have multiple groups, and they're called multiple group threats. Um, and by adding multiple group, we have one for comparison. Right, so if we have, uh, you take the testing threat, right? You have uh, one group that um, gets a new method, one group that still continues using the old method. Um, and if you see that, for example, the, the group that continued having the old method improved slightly, you could say, okay, so there's some element of testing that's going on. But if you see that the group that had the new teaching method improved more, so say uh, the average in the uh, control group, they averaged uh, improved from the first test to the second test by 5%. But for those who had the new teaching method, the average improved by 15%. Then we know it's not something about just t taking the test. It, again, it's, there's, there's something else, there's some other difference, because the only difference between the groups was uh, the, the teaching method at that point. Uh, they should have all matured the same way. They should all have history, uh, the same history. Uh, you, you should have the same mortality threats, um, unless one teaching method is more boring, and so four members of one group drop out, um, which it would be a concern. But you should have the same mortality threats. Um, so uh, you you then are left with any difference, right, between those two groups on the post-test um, shows that um, uh, the, the remainder part, right, the remaining improvement that was different between the two groups shows that it was your cause, it was a new teaching method. So types of multiple group threats, um, and these are related to selection bias or selection threat. And so these are any factor other than uh, program that leads to post-test difference between uh, groups. Uh, so for each single group, uh, so in, in this case, it would be um, selection threat. So um, uh, if, for example, um, people who go into one group end up uh, uh, being smarter, like so. So again, if we if we don't randomly assign people to groups and so we we just do it you know this class gets this teaching method this class gets this other teaching method right so the new teaching method goes to one class and the other teaching method goes to another class well there might be important differences between the two classes that explains it right so if we see that the uh so we have a control group and we have a treatment group but because maybe um the instruction in the first class had already been better uh, maybe the students coming in were just better in general in one class because there's a whole bunch of different factors that could, are different between the class. The students may not be the same between the two classes. Um, we can't be sure that it's actually just this new instruction that led to uh, the, uh, uh, the difference in, in the second test. It could be something just related to difference between the the two different classrooms. And so that, that would be a, a different problem. For each single group threat to internal validity, there's a corresponding multiple group threat. So selection history, selection maturation, uh, stuff like that. So for example, selection history would be if those who uh, are in one group, so those who get the new teaching method, right, have a different history than those who are in the, uh, control group, so those who are getting, continuing with the old teaching method, um, and if that history 
changes their results on their test, then we have difference between the groups and this difference related to history is producing um, a, uh, an effect on, uh, on, on the results. Uh, same thing for selection maturation, uh, all the different ones, uh, selection mortality. So if, if members of, uh, if you're comparing uh, uh, to, if you're giving uh, to two different classes and one class is just from a group that's known to have higher dropouts. Uh, maybe from, uh, you've got two different classes in two different schools and one school, uh, the school that uh, gets the new teaching method um, has high student retention, right? Very few dropouts. Uh, and the school that gets, has the old teaching method has a, a real problem with uh, students dropping out. So you've got an important difference between these two groups that's not related to the new teaching method. And this can lead to a uh, difference in the results and could lead you to drawing wrong conclusions. You think it's a new teaching method led to the improvement uh, and it's really had to do with changes in, you know, the worst students in one school dropped out, the worst students in the other school didn't drop out. And so it has to do with uh, mortality. Um, so random assignment to group is the best method for dealing with multiple group threats to validity. So uh, we randomly uh, assign, you know, rather than, uh, we, so, uh, uh, there's not uh, a biased way of who gets uh, the class. So say uh, we want to be testing uh, 100 different schools. So rather than just, you know, proving one gets this one, one gets the other one. Uh, say we want to be testing 100 schools. Uh, so we would randomly select 50 of them get uh, the new teaching method, 50 of them get the old teaching method, right? And we hope that by randomly doing it, that we've eliminated any differences between the group or not, particularly if you've got a large enough uh, samples, right? So if with 100, you get 50 uh, getting one and 50 getting the other, that you're not just gonna by bad luck get, you know, all of the ones that are more likely to have student dropouts get one, right? You're probably gonna have a mix of those who are likely to get, have dropouts in both groups. You're likely to have um, similar history, a mixture of histories in both groups. Uh, you're likely to have a mixture of kind of maturation between both groups uh, and stuff like that. So that um, by making it random, you avoid kind of biases in oh, th those who volunteer for the new teaching method are, uh, say it was just on a volunteer basis, who wants want to try out the new teaching methods. Well, it might be the ones that are more likely to try out the new teaching method are schools that are also trying other new things um, because they're really taking teaching seriously, where the other one is one that is a, gotten a little bit complacent or lazy in their teaching. Um, and so if you allow groups to kind of volunteer into whether they get the new teaching method or the old one, well, that could lead to, to all kinds of, of the different biases. But if you randomly assign it, right? So it, laziness doesn't come into, or complacency doesn't come into play, then we can eliminate most of these multi, uh, multiple group threats. So the, the two biggest things so far that we've seen for it, uh, eliminating um, group threats to validity so far are multiple groups. So to eliminate uh, uh, single group threats is we want to have, bring in a second group. So we want to bring in a control group. And to eliminate multiple group threats, we want to bring in random assignment. And so if you're not able to get multiple groups or if you're not able to get in random assignment to whether you're getting treatment, then these threats are gonna be more problematic. So when you're evaluating designs, or evaluating different designs, always bear this in mind. So um, if you're trying to make causal claims and you wanna be making causal claims, if you don't have a control group, well, you're gonna be dealing with, there's a, a whole bunch of possible threats to validity, right? And some of them may be real concerns and you're gonna to have to address um, each of them. If you've got multiple groups, but you don't have random assignment, so you've got some who got the treatment, some who didn't get the, uh, 
uh, treatment, but you didn't control who got it and you weren't, so you weren't able to randomly assign. Or you could control who got it, but you weren't able to use random assignment. Um, and sometimes that, that's not possible. And you're going to have to be dealing with multiple group threats and you're going to have to be addressing, you know, how can all of these multiple group threats um, have, you know, um, distorted your study. And the last group are social threats to validity. Uh, so social threats to internal validity are threats to internal validity that arise because social research is conducted in real world human context where people will react to not only what affects them, but also to what is happening to others around them. So um, we're dealing with people um, and they live in kind of a society, uh, a social society. Uh, and so they react to um, not only, you know, things happening to them, but also things that are happening around them. So social threats can be managed if treatment group and control groups are unaware of each other, or at least not aware of treatment assignment. So treatment assignment means, did you get the medicine or did you get the sugar pill? Did you get the new teaching method or the old teaching method, right? So were you, which one group were you assigned to? So for example, in uh, medical studies, um, rather than having the treatment group get a medicine and the other group gets nothing, well, that the other group would know that they got nothing, so they know what group in, they're in. So that's why often they, you hear the placebo, the sugar pill. Um, so both groups physically take something that resembles a, a pill. Uh, the pills may look even identical. So both groups believe that they're getting the medicine. They know that some people aren't getting medicine, some people are, but because they're getting a pill, they, they don't know which one they're getting. Um, so social threats can be managed if they don't know you're getting. So even if they talk to people in the other group, nobody knows what they're getting. So uh, nobody knows, you, you know, to, uh, uh, to compare notes um, and or unaware of each other, right? So if you, you don't even know that there's another group, you don't know who's in the study, anyone else, then you can't be reacting to what they're getting. So diffusion or imitation of treatment. So social threat to internal validity occurs because a comparison group learns about the program either directly or indirectly from program group participants. Uh, so kind of put in the, and going back to our teaching one. So if one class receives a new instructional method and the other class does not receive the new uh, teaching method, but members of both class study together, then the benefits of the new teaching method will be spread to members of the control group. So then when they go and take a test, those in the, uh, you know, who did, got, had the old teaching method, right, are going to do a little bit better potentially because yes, they didn't have the new teaching method, but they got some benefits of it from studying with members of the other class. So you could eliminate this by just having them study separately. Uh, ideally, you know, that, that would control the threat and practice, you know, in a school setting, if, if we're, we're trying to implement new teaching methods, um, unless the schools were, far apart, um, if it were two say classes in the same school, there's very little that you could do to keep them from studying together. So this would be a potential threat. Um, in, uh, in, in, in medical type trials, uh, a reason for keeping the groups apart is, so yes, you could have the sugar pill in so that people don't know what they get. But what some people have done in studies before, because they don't know what group they're in, they'll um, share medicine with those, or they'll share what they're getting with members of the other group. So for example, they might come to agreements with somebody in the other group saying, okay, um, I'll take half of your pills, you take half of my pills. So this way we're guaranteed that we're getting at least half the time we're getting the medicine. Uh, and so we could be improving, um, which is understandable, right? Because this way they're kind of hedging their bed and making sure they're getting something. Um, but for the researcher, for learning the outcome, it means that everybody's getting the same thing. Everybody's getting 50% of the time they're getting the medicine. So when you're then at the end comparing, if they don't know this is happening, and then at the end you're comparing um, what uh, the differences between the groups, you're gonna find no differences between the groups, even though it might be that the medicine is incredibly effective. Um, so th this would be, it could be a problem. Uh, uh, compensatory uh, rivalry. So a social threat to internal validity that occurs when one group knows the program another group is getting and because of that develops a competitive attitude with the other group. So this is where if you know that the other one's in the treatment group. So 
a part of uh, so if you're not getting the sugar pill or if you figured out that the, the, the thing that you have is a sugar pill so for example if the treatment group receives the new teaching method and the control group is aware of it uh, the members of the control group may study harder to compete with members of the treatment group. So, you know, if you're in the class and you're using the old teaching method and the other one's getting this fun, new, supposed to be really helpful teaching method, right? You might be jealous and be like, hell no, I don't want them to do better than me. So I'm going to study more than I normally would. Um, and so then when you take the test, you're doing better. Uh, the control group does better. And so it looks like there's less difference. But really the reason that it looks like there's less difference is, isn't because the new teaching method didn't work, it's because those who were taking the old teaching method just studied so much more. Uh, resentful demoralization is kind of the opposite. So a social threat that, to internal validity that occurs when the comparison group knows what the program group is getting and becomes discouraged or angry and gives up. So in, 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 the, in, in the last one, it was they know that they're getting it and so that they work harder, right? They try to compete. In this case, it's they're like, well, Heck, uh, the other group it should be doing better than me because you will get this new teaching method. Uh, I'm going to continue sucking because uh, uh, I've got this old teaching method that doesn't work. Nobody cares about me. And so why should I bother even trying? Right? I'm not getting the good teaching. I'm not getting the good education. So why bother and let's just stop? Um, or if the... Uh, Look, if you know that you're not getting the treatment in a, in a medical trial, right? And so you like, I'm not gonna get better. So you get really, really discouraged. Uh, and so uh, those who are getting the treatment are happy and uh, you're super discouraged and uh, you, you know, stop exercising, you've got a negative attitude, uh, you don't eat well because you're like, well, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to be getting better. So you, you just kind of give up. And all of those things can affect health. So there's another difference between just having the medicine and not. And then uh, compensatory equalization of treatment, social threat to internal validity that occurs when the control group is given a program or treatment, usually by a well-meaning third party, designed to make up or compensate for the treatment the program group gets. So this is where a third party comes in, right? And they're aware of who's in the treatment group and who's in the control group. And they know that they treat those in the control group are at a disadvantage. So they kind of uh, either give uh, other advantages, right? So maybe you give extra time on the test to those in the control group, which will help them do better. Or you smuggle in some of the treatment. So you smuggle in some benefits, or you smuggle in some treatment pills, some of the, the real pills to the control group. Uh, resulting in groups that do not fully differ on treatment. Uh, so when you then end up testing to see if there's a difference in health between the two groups, uh, who uh, because some either extra advantages in terms of other medicines came in uh, to the control group, so those who were, weren't getting the new drug, uh, or um, because some of the drug was smuggled into them by you know uh, some other person. Uh, we don't see the same health difference. Or if the design was for the teaching one, for the test in the new uh, classes, right? If the design was implemented by, uh, or was made, the study is paid for by the government, but it's teachers at the school level who are implementing it. And the teacher and the control group doesn't want their students to fall behind. And so they start either smuggling in a little bit of the new teaching method, or they compensate them some way by the teacher works harder than they did before, or they give them extra time on the test. When you're then comparing the two groups, the control group's done unnaturally better. Um, and so you're gonna have kind of, uh, you're gonna be led to the conclusion that there's no causal effect. Uh, the, new, uh, tr uh, the new teaching method doesn't lead to an improvement when in reality it does. So we're gonna talk briefly about types of designs in here. Uh, more just kind of an introduction to kind of how we look at uh, designs. So design of a study is a specification of how the research question will be answered, right? So we've got a research question, we've got a thesis, we've got a, um, a hypothesis, but now we need to go out and gather data. So how are we gonna go out and, and gather our data? Uh, so a research design should specify how the selected the participants. So who are we gonna select to be in our participants? Uh, in our, uh, so if it's with, uh, with humans, so say it's a survey or it's an experiment, how are we going to be selecting who's in the study? It's observational, you know, what data are we going to be gathering? 
um, how are we going to be assigning uh, who gets, say, uh, who get if it's an experiment uh, or something that's hoping for uh, being a causal study, who's getting the treatment or who's not? So are we using, say, we have control over who gets uh, the treatment or gets the kind of the independent variable? Uh, do we have control over who gets it? If we do, um, are we assigning it to them randomly or is it based on some form of convenience? And if we, we don't have, uh, if we're not able to assign um, who gets it, and in the real world oftentimes we're not able to assign who gets, who's in the treatment and who's in the control group, um, then how was it assigned? Do we know how it was assigned? Um, and then how do we choose our measures um, and the time frame? Um, of, of the study, so how do we choose what we're measuring to see, um, to test the outcome, right? So if we wanna see, for example, if we wanna be testing, is this new teaching method helpful, right? So time frame, how long does the teaching method uh, need to be implemented so that we can uh, study its effects, right? Do they get one day of it, one week of it, one month of it, one semester of it, a whole year of it? Um, how long does, time frame have to be uh, and what are the choice of measures so how are we testing what it means to be doing better um, so um, what tests are we using uh, are we using the kind of standard tests that we used to have before are we using some other measure of how well it's doing in terms of are we interviewing students to see you know do you like it better does, does it make you want to stay in school more are we measuring it so are we measuring you know, quality of the teaching method based on uh, it improving retention of students, uh, or is it in terms of uh, higher scores on tests? Um, what, um, how are we measuring um, whatever concept uh, uh, or whatever kind of theoretical construct that was of interest? How are we actually measuring it? And so those all go into design questions. So design is incredibly important for um, a study because it allows, a, if you've got poor design, uh, then you may think that you're testing your theory and you may think they're answering your question, but you may be actually introducing a whole bunch of either internal validity problems or uh, construct validity or uh, conclusion validity problems, particularly in this case, in, in terms of the design. So the analysis will probably bring in more of your um, conclusion validity problems, but in terms of your design, you're really gonna be dealing with your construct validity. So um, are the measures you're using actually fitting with the constructs that you're trying to, uh, that you're hypothesizing about or that you're theorizing about. So I, I, we talked about uh, last time, so democracy, right? So if we want to be saying democracies don't fight other democracies, so how are we measuring democracies in that? Or does our measure fit our concept? Um, so that's really important in terms of the measurement. And we'll talk more about measurement in, in future classes uh, and internal validity. So method of assignment, selection of participants, um, stuff like that um, are gonna be really important in terms of how are we dealing with the threats to internal validity. Um, there's sort of notation that's um, used. Um, so we're gonna use this notation when we're talking about the experimental designs. I'm not gonna be using it when we're talking about the other designs because uh, I wanna go more in depth on experiment. Um, not because you're necessarily going to be doing experiments. It's one option that you could do a survey experiment here. Um, it's more just that because we've been talking about internal validity today, um, in terms of internal validity, um, experiments um, do the best. They, they may have some other problems in terms of external validity, in terms of uh, even potentially construct validity. Uh, it's not to say that experiments are universally the best, but in terms of internal validity, um, they tend to um, be able to control threats to validity of uh, the best. So since today we're really focusing a lot on design when it comes to causation, so internal validity type issues, I wanna go in depth on why is it that experiments do the best. But then when you're looking at other types of designs later, when you're thinking about um, uh, um, other possibilities, so, um, so you may, for example, do a survey experiment where you're introducing a treatment. But you also might be interested in, say, doing a survey and you want to find out, um, does gender influence uh, preference on something, right? And you can't treat 
gender. So you can't do an experiment on gender uh, because, uh, you know, uh, particularly, I mean, gender can change uh, from life, uh, but uh, sex, um, you know, you're not going to be changing sex. You're not going to be changing race, right? You're not going to be assigning race to somebody. You're not going to be saying, oh, today you're going to be this other race, racial group, right? Those are things, uh, even most psychological or sociological characteristics, there's certain traits um, that we, we, we can't be assigning when we're doing surveys. So if you're interested in the effect of one of those on, um, on, on some outcome, right? Um, you, you, you could very easily do a um, kind of a, a correlation study. But to get to, to the causation part, you're going to have to be thinking about how am I dealing with these threats and validity because I'm not getting random assignment. Uh, I'm not. I, I'm not dealing with. So I'm not dealing with groups that are necessarily the same. So how am I dealing with these threats to validity? Uh, some will say you can't. You can't go beyond um, just saying there's a correlation. Um, but because it's so many of the questions we want to answer, we want to be making causal claims, and we can't be doing experiments. Uh, we also try to find ways of getting around it. Um, but I want to be giving you kind of the gold standard um, so that each time you're thinking about designing your study, you could be seeing how am I departing from this kind of the gold standard. Uh, and because of those uh, ways that I'm departing, what potential problems are they introducing, right? And then you start thinking about how can I address these potential problems? A, you want to be honest, right? In your, in your design section, in your analysis section, you want to be always upfront about potential threats to validity, right? But particularly the ones you couldn't manage. And for the ones that you were able to figure out a way of, okay, so this is a potential threat, so this is what I did to, to deal with it. Um, then, uh, you also want to be discussing, look, uh, this is a potential threat to validity because of this design, and this is how I tried to handle it. Uh, so you want to be as upfront as possible on that. Uh, so in order to summarize uh, complex designs, uh, researchers often use a simple notation system uh, to represent uh, steady design elements. So essentially, we kind of make a diagram of, uh, of the, the design. Uh, and so certain things that we're going to include in this diagram will be observations or measures, and we represent those by the letter O. So for example, if somebody takes a test, right, that's an observation or a measurement. So in our, in our, our, in our story about the, the, uh, the new teaching method, uh, we're gonna take each time somebody takes a test. So if they take that test before, or if we take, they take the test after, uh, um, that's gonna count as an observation. So we'll list each of those with the letter O. Um, Treatment or program, so say get in the new teaching method, somebody who gets the treatment, so any, any group that gets uh, the new medication, that gets the new teaching method, gets an, uh, an X. Uh, the group uh, that is in the control group, so it gets the sugar pill, it gets the old teaching method, doesn't get an X. So the X shows that we've got the, the treatment or program that, that uh, we wanted to be implementing if it's uh, you know, a new economic program, right? We want to help uh, uh, solve poverty by putting in place this uh, micro lending program. Um, the people who had access to the micro lending program get the X. The people who don't have access to the micro lending program get, uh, don't get a letter there. Groups. Uh, in a study design uh, diagram, each group receives its own line, right? So group one, say, your treatment group would go on the top line. And then the next line below, you'd have uh, the group, uh, the other group. Assignment to groups. So we would note how um, the assignment method, usually at the start of the line for each group, were they randomly assigned uh, to the group? So we'd write an R for each group. Were they uh, non equivalent groups? So uh, they weren't randomly assigned. And so this would come up in non experimental uh, groups. So we'd write an N for non equivalent groups or non random assignment. And if they're assigned by cutoff, so if there's some way, um, we're not really going to be talking about this, but if there was some kind of cutoff point that determined whether you went into one group or the other group, we'd put a C for it was assignment by cutoff. So if you were below a certain thing, you went into one group. If you're up, uh, above that certain uh, criteria, you went to the other group. We're not going to go further on assignment by cutoff. Um, so most of the designs we're going to be talking about will either have, when we're talking experiments, will be random assignment. 
Uh, and then we're not going to look at diagrams for it, but the other is this non-experimental groups. When they're trying to make causal claims, it's going to be a non-equivalent group uh, design uh, because the groups will be, so again, uh, gender. We can't say that the groups are identical on anything. Uh, they were, weren't randomly assigned to, the, uh, to whether they got the what, uh, gender uh, or to the race. Um, so it's not, we can't say that the people who uh, got, you know, assigned to a certain race are exactly identical uh, to uh, the people who got the different race on all other characteristics. Uh, and time, finally, in design moves from left to right. So an event that occurs first will uh, come at the left and then the next event and the next event and the next event. So say you have an outcome then the treatment, then the outcome, you'd go O, X, O. So uh, um, observation or measure one. So uh, first, then you've got your uh, X for the treatment, and then you've got your second measure. And then types of design. So it's kind of um, how we think about the kind of the types of design. We're not going to be dealing with all of these, but um, kind of some of the ways that you could think about uh, these is, um, is a random assignment used? Uh, and if random assignment is used, uh, then we have, uh, yes, we have a randomized experiment. If no, then we have to ask ourselves, is there a control group or multiple measures? If yes, we're dealing with the quasi-experiment, which we're not gonna talk about today, um, because uh, they're a little bit more complicated to understand. Uh, we're not really gonna be implementing uh, them. And it, it's it, uh, they're a little bit more complex to understand in terms of also the the benefits and not. And is there a, a control group or multiple measures? No, we're dealing with a non-experiment. Um, really, I'm just essentially when we're talking about non-experiments, I'm going to be merging these two groups. So we're going to have randomized experiment uh, where there's random assignment, so where you control assignment to the group, and then we're going to have kind of the the others where you don't control assignment. That's more or less how we're going to be proceeding um, in this course. All right, so introduction to experimental methods. All right, so um, we're going to be talking about experimental methods. First, we want to be talking about kind of the, the logic of experimentation, why, why it's necessary, and what, what was the major problem that we see in um, that we need to overcome in finding causation. Um, and so we're gonna be using the Nyman Rubin causal model, or often just short to the Rubin causal model, uh, and the potential outcomes uh, framework. So let's start with kind of a, a, um, a thought experiment. So did Hitler cause World War II? Um, so not what was the fact, did Hitler cause World War II? Um, which is essentially, uh, and so you could talk, you know, a lot about, uh, you know, there'd be a lot of answers to this question and it would focus on all the bad things Hitler did and all the, the, the ways that, you know, the actions he took um, led to World War II. And so you could come up with a conclusion saying, yes, Hitler led to World War II. He caused World War II. Then there's other explanations of World War II that look at, you know, kind of the unfair peace after World War I and all the economic problems that Germany had been having, uh, and that really the tension from World War I wasn't resolved, uh, and saying that, you know, there's some scholars who would make an argument that, uh, yeah, I mean, Hitler's a really bad guy, and yes, some of the dynamics of World War II were caused by him, but that war, a second world war between those countries was essentially inevitable, um, given that just, um, the situation in Europe and the balance of power in Europe wasn't settled after World War One, uh, and so there was just kind of tension that still needed to be resolved. So there's multiple possible explanations for World War One. So I uh, sorry for World War Two, um, and so the, the question we'd want to know is, you know, did Hitler cause World War Two, or what, what, was it a, a, a different factor? Um, and, and it, it's possible um, and probably likely that it was, you know, many of them. Um, but if we want to know, you know, did Hitler himself play a role? Um, well, um, and, and then we want to know separate studies, did these other factors play a role? Uh, now, 
The problem is that in order to answer this question, we need to observe two different situations. So we need to look at the world that's existed, the world with Hitler, and then we need to look at the counterfactual situation where everything else is the same, but Hitler did not exist. So we have all the same legacies of World War I, and Germany had the same economic problems, blah, blah, blah. Everything else is the same, but Hitler didn't come around. And then we could see, you know, was it Hitler's personality or something about him that led to World War II? Or, you know, if Hitler wasn't there, we still would have had World War II. Uh, in which case, then, we would say that Hitler didn't cause it. He wasn't a causal factor, but he was just kind of along for the ride. Um, and it, both are, are, are possible answers. The problem is, because uh, then we could compare the outcome of, uh, in, in, in this scenario to the outcome in this scenario and see, you know, is there a difference? And if there's no difference, then Hitler didn't play a role. If there is a difference, then Hitler played a role. And that's how you would, that's the way that you could establish a cause. Um, the problem is, is that, um, so we would compare these two potential outcomes. The problem is, is that we can't do that, right? History runs once. We can't go back around and retry and create all the same conditions that existed in the 1930s and see, all right, well, let's just rerun Europe, uh, during that time period, just, um, not have Hitler. Everything else, all the exact same people come back from the dead and are, are, are there and all the same, we, we go back to this technology of, of the time and the economy of the time and the social values of the time and everything of the exact same time, but we're just going to rerun that and not have Hitler. Um, well, that's not possible, but it's also what is needed to be able to really, really um, establish causation um, is to see you know, and, and that's the way that it, it, it's done in natural sciences, right? So you take, you know, uh, have one rock and you do something to it and to see what's the difference with, you know, the other rock. Um, and, and, and so that's, and because the rocks are essentially the same, we're able to do it to identical. Um, but in the social sciences, um, we can't see history run twice. In the natural sciences, we essentially can see history run twice because the rocks are the same or molecules are the same. Um, but in the social world, so many from uh, psychological characteristics to sociological, to political, to geographic, to economic, uh, all these different characteristics change uh, with time. Um, so you, we can't rerun history. We can't create the exact same conditions in another part of the world. Say, so let's uh, do something here in this one region of the world and do something different in the other region of the world. Well, those two great regions might be different. We can't run uh, two parallels. And so that's a problem in, in establishing causation. So we can never observe both potential outcomes. Um, so Hitler either existed or he didn't exist. An individual either goes to college or doesn't go to college. So if you want to be finding out what's the impact of going to college, right? And we want to be looking at, okay, so we could say, we, we could be pretty conclusive. We've got one individual goes and we have that same, and then we see what happens if, you know, say we could run two parallel timelines. In so one timeline, the person goes to college and the other timeline, the other person, the same person doesn't go to college. And everything else is different. Between, it's the same between these two timelines. But in reality, we only have the one timeline or maybe there are other timelines, but we don't have access to them. Um, so in our timeline, it's our ability to know what's happening, an individual either goes to college or doesn't go to college. Um, a government either cuts taxes or doesn't cut taxes. An individual either sees a therapist or doesn't see a therapist. Um, and so we, we, don't get, we, we get to see either one of these situations and we don't know what happened in the other. So we don't necessarily know the causal role of that thing. And if you can think back to all the threats to internal validity, when you have just one group, so just uh, if you don't have the comparison, um, there's all kinds of threats of things, other things that be causing the outcome. Um, so for example, an individual goes to therapy, right? And we're, we want to see, um, it, does that mean that uh, therapy improved? And after going to therapy, they start improving. But it may have been just a whole bunch of other things changed in their life. And we don't know if it's those other things. 
Um, the way that you could solve that is by having all those other things be happening to that exact same person, but they're not going to therapy, but that's not possible. So to address this problem, the uh, nine room and uh, causal model looks at average treatment effects. Uh, so uh, the fundamental problem of causal inference. And so we refer to that uh, as the fundamental problem of causal inference, that we can't see both potential outcomes. We can't see the uh, Hitler existed and Hitler didn't exist. We, we can't see the individual goes to college or the individual doesn't go to college. We can't see both these uh, uh, potential outcomes. The, they got the treatment, they didn't get the treatment scenario. And so this causes a problem for causal inference. And so to overcome this, we use what are called average treatment effects. Uh, it's overcome by comparing the average effect of a treatment uh, on a group rather than on an individual. So we compare a group gets therapy to a group that doesn't get therapy. Um, it doesn't help our, our Hitler example, but we could look at a group of individuals who goes to college and compare them to a group who doesn't go to college. We compare, uh, uh, say, a group who had their cut at a taxes cut, say half the population got their taxes cut and half the population doesn't get their taxes cut. Um, yeah, so we could compare uh, the average outcome for individuals who went to a therapist to the average outcome of individuals who did not go to therapist. So by comparing groups, we then are able to get, we can't get two versions of the individual, um, but we are able to get uh, uh, two groups. So in this case, we've solved that kind of the first part um, of kind of the single threat to validity where you only had one group. Because of the way um, kind of uh, social world works, we can't create two groups of, of individuals, right? But we can create two, uh, or we can't create a treatment or control for an individual, right? But we can create a treatment and control for groups. And so we've overcome kind of those single threats to validity. Um, we still, though, at, at this point in time, have um, the uh, multiple groups of flexibility because it could be that the group, the group that got went to therapy were in, was in some way different from uh, the groups that didn't go to therapy. So they compare the average treatment effect based on creating the second group. So uh, we compare the average effect on those who went to therapy. Uh, in terms of improving well-being to those who think of the average effect of those who think go to therapy. Um, got rid of the single group threat, but we still have the multiple group threat, right? Because there could be some just difference between those who went to therapy and those who didn't. But at least we've solved the first problem. And so by comparing groups, we can see both situations. We can see the potential outcome when treatment and therapy is present, and we can see the potential outcome when treatment or therapy is not present, the control group. Uh, and so that's kind of the first step in solving the problem. Yeah, so we won't have uh, uh, first problem, but we still do have the second problem. Won't we have problems of internal validity if the two groups are different? What if those two, uh, uh, those who get therapy also try a new medication? What if those who don't seek therapy have different individual characteristics that make them mature differently? Um, so we still potentially have these multiple group threats. So how to do uh, does the room causal model um, solve that part of the problem, the multiple group threat? Uh, solve this problem through random assignment to treatment and control groups. So random assignment is the process of assigning your sample into two or more subgroups by chance. Yeah. Procedures for random assignment can vary from, uh, uh, oops, flipping a coin, not filling a coin, uh, to using a table of random numbers, to using the random number uh, capability of a computer. And so, uh, how does a random assignment help? Through random assignment, we can achieve probabilistic equivalence between our treatment and control group. Uh, while no, no two individuals in the groups are identical, the groups are identical on average. Uh, so probabilistic equivalence means it's a notion that two groups, if measured infinitely, would on average perform identically. So for example, based on random assignment, sufficient group size. So this does require sufficient group size. If the groups are too small, then you're probably gonna have some difference between them. But if the groups are big enough, uh, we would expect a similar percentage, for example, of women in each group, of conservatives in each group, of college graduates of each group, of Caucasians in each group, of political uh, 
uh, not uh, those who are politically knowledgeable in each group. So while no two individuals are the same, in terms of the characteristics that we think might matter that might lead to um, kind of selection threats that lead to the groups behaving differently. So different levels of maturation between the two groups, different levels of history between the two groups, two different levels of mortality between the two groups. You know, in terms of all the characteristics that we think should lead to those differences between the two groups, the two groups are identical, or that could lead to differences between the two groups, the two groups are identical. So if we think, for example, uh, women are more likely to have uh, uh, mature differently than men, and in one group has more women uh, than the other, then we would have maturation threat. But if the two groups have the same percentage of women, then we've, we've solved that problem. So as long as random assignment is able to achieve um, groups that are um, near identical on the, uh, all the characteristics that matter, then we've removed this uh, we've got probabilistically equivalent groups. Now, it's not gonna work each time. So it is always a good idea when you're even doing a randomized experiment with random assignment, that you still check that your groups are identical. So it's something I always do is still take, compare kind of the average, say, percentage of women in each of my different groups, uh, average uh, ideology in each of my groups, just to make sure that, you know, you didn't get unlucky, it is probabilistic. Um, so sometimes your groups aren't going to be identical. Um, the larger your group size, the more likely, um, but um, it's still something good to, to verify. And since the two groups are now comparable, uh, we can reasonably certain that any difference in outcome is caused by the treatment. Threats to internal validity, uh, validity are reasonably small. And so this is the log uh, logic of randomized experiments. Um, I, and so by doing this, so by having the second group, by having your control group, so doing average moving from away from the problem of looking at two individuals to two groups um, and look at the average treatment effects, we're able to deal with um, the internal, the fundamental problem of causal inference and we're able to deal with the kind of single group threat stability. And using random assignment, we're able to deal with the multiple group threats. Um, so what are some, kind of uh, experiments that fit with this model. So we've got the two, the, the most basic one is called the two group experimental, uh, for two group experiments. So where we've got one uh, treatment and one uh, control uh, is, and this is a post-test only design. So this is kind of your most basic, uh, but also one of your most powerful designs. Um, and so remember, this is group one, this is group two, and time goes left to right. So the first thing that happens is we randomly assign, right? So this group is randomly assigned and this group is randomly assigned. So we had like say a population here and it, some got randomly assigned to this group, some got randomly assigned to this group. The next thing that happens is some get the treatment, some don't get the treatment. So some get the new teaching method or some go to therapy, the others uh, don't go to therapy, don't get the new teaching method. And then we measure the outcome. And so what we end up doing is we're comparing, we want to be seeing, because these groups are identical, what we're looking at is what is the difference between these two groups in the outcome? So based on uh, well-being, if it's therapy or scores on a test, uh, if it's, uh, say, new teaching method, and we want to be seeing, um, and then we could be saying any difference, because we've de dealt with the single and multiple group threats to validity, any difference here, is caused by um, the treatment. Because it's the only difference between the groups, right? So because it's the only difference between the groups, it, any difference in the outcome has to be explained by that only difference. Now, do, do bear in mind, it, this doesn't deal with social threats of validity. So those are still possible, for example, if the two groups are able to speak to each other. Um, so they're able to, say, study together. Uh, or those who went to therapy meet with those who didn't go to therapy and share some of what they learned in therapy. So that doesn't deal with this type of design, doesn't deal with that. You need to take other steps to deal with social threats. Um, but it does deal with all of your single and multiple group threat to validity. Um, so uh, since we use random assignment, we could be reasonably confident the two groups are identical. Uh, therefore, we could compare the outcomes. Uh, two group experimental design, pre-test, post-test. 
Uh, so since random assignment does not fully guarantee group equivalence, the pretest post test design allows for an examination of group equivalence by comparing scores on the pretest. So in, in this one, we do first we randomly assign. Because you're not sure that random assignments necessarily work, we can take a pretest and see did the two groups with the average in both groups the same today on, on the test. And if they're not uh, the same, you found to be equivalent on certain characteristics, you can use statistical methods to control for the difference. Uh, so what we would do is if we see that there's a difference here, we'd use statistics to then update these results. Um, uh, if, uh, if randomization works, this design is actually probably better um, because it, uh, it removes any kind of history type things, even though the history threads with multiple groups should be the same. Um, it still means that uh, you get kind of a pure experience with your second and the most kind of important outcome measure. If randomization, randomization did not work, this is would be your superior design. Fortunately, you're not gonna know ahead of time whether randomization worked. The only way you're gonna know whether randomization worked really is to have some form of other measure. You can make your other measure, one way of doing it would be different. So rather than testing outcomes on uh, tests, you look at them on a whole, you compare the two groups on all kinds of different measures. So psychological, sociological, or social, economic, psychological characteristics, demographic characteristics to see if they're the same. Fortunately, you're never going to know all of the variables that could be relevant. So there could be some unobservable variables that are relevant, uh, but that's one possible option. So this is also another really common design uh, that is a lot. Uh, it, and it deals with all of your single and multiple group threats of validity. Um, it uh, doesn't, again, uh, control the social ones, threats of validity. Um, but it's another really good design. Um, factorial designs is kind of an expansion on kind of your true group experimental design. So, um, and factorial designs are designs that focus on uh, the programmer treatment, its components, and its major dimensions and enable you to determine whether the program has an effect, whether different components are effective, and whether uh, there are interactions in the effects caused by the subcomponents. So this could go either two ways. So it might be, for example, you introduce a new teaching method and you want to look at two different dynamics, some two different subcomponents of uh, the uh, teaching method. Or it might be that you've got kind of two different treatments and you want to see, are they both working and are they interacting with each other? So we'll return to interaction in a second, but let's set up the first basic design. So a school is introducing a new teaching method and trying out a new class schedule. So again, left to right is time. And then these would be two different groups. So we've got two by two so factorial design. So we've got four groups. Uh, and so first group, we see normal teaching method and normal schedule. Uh, so because this is normal and this is normal, there's no treatment. So we just have random assignment and our outcome measure. Here we have a treatment one at zero, which is showing treatment number one. So essentially that would be showing the first treatment, not the second treatment. Uh, so new teaching method and normal schedule. So they got that first treatment relating to teaching method on the second treatment or the second part that we're measuring, the second component that we're measuring, uh, they've got the normal schedule, so no treatment. The second group, got zero, one. So didn't get the first treatment, got the second treatment. So they're getting the normal teaching method. So control, they're in the control group when it comes to the teaching method, but they're in the treatment group when it comes to the schedule. Uh, sometimes you'll see this noted here, this one will be X zero, zero. So show as treatment, but as if there was a treatment, but it's then noted as zero, zero for no trip control control. Uh, so essentially a one means uh, treatment, a zero means control, and we'd be listing the first one. So teaching method first and uh, new schedule second. And then the last group, one, one. So they got, they're in the treatment group for both. So they got the new teaching method and the new schedule. So you could think we have four different classes in the school. One's using the new uh, normal, everything's status quo, normal teacher method, uh, normal schedule. 
this group's got both, so the new schedule and the new teaching method. Uh, this one's got uh, normal teaching method, but new schedule, and this one's got new teaching method and normal schedule. So by going through the four groups, we've went through all four possibilities. When you're dealing with two characteristics that both have two possible uh, traits or two possible levels, um, you end up with a two by two. So you require to test this out four groups. So with factorial designs, we examine both main effects and interaction effects. So what are main effects? So main effects are an outcome that shows consistent dif uh, difference between all levels of a factor. Um, so each of these are considered as uh, factors. Um, so for example, students receiving the new teaching method perform better on the test regardless of the class schedule, and there's a main effective teaching method. So whatever happens with schedule, teaching method works then we could say there's a main effect of teaching method because it, it just works it and it doesn't matter on teaching method. Um, now, and an interaction effect occurs uh, when differences in one factor depend on which level you are on another factor. So for example, if students receiving the new schedule only do better on the new test, if they're also receiving the new teaching method, then there's an interaction effect the effect of the schedule depends on the level of the teaching method, right? So if we looked just at the group uh, that had the normal teaching method and the new schedule, so if we looked at, for example, uh, uh, normal teaching method and new schedule, right? This one has normal teaching method and new schedule. And we look and we compare it to this group. Uh, to group one, so the, the control control group, and here we just have still normal teaching method like the group one, um, but we've got the new schedule, and we see there's no difference. But then in this group, uh, where we've got the new teaching method and the new schedule, we see the strongest effect. And we see a stronger effect that we have when we just had the new teaching method. So it's saying that, yes, the new teaching method is still doing something, but we see something even stronger that's saying, okay, schedule seems to have mattered here because there's a different outcome between these two groups. So new teaching method and new teaching method. So when we've got the new teaching method, the schedule matters. Uh, so in that case, we're seeing an interaction effect where schedule matters, but dependent on the level of teaching. So there's no main effect, but there's an interaction effect where with teaching method, regardless of what happens with the schedule, if you've got the new teaching method uh, compared to groups where you've got the normal teaching method, you see an improvement, then there's a main effect, right? So the uh, success of normal teaching method doesn't depend on uh, 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 the uh, level of, uh, uh, but so, uh, yeah, uh, doesn't depend on the schedule. Um, so oftentimes what you'll end up finding, so in that case, we'd have a, a strong main effect of teaching method. We'd probably have a weak uh, main effect for uh, normal schedule, because if we compared the, all, everybody who had the normal, uh, uh, normal schedule to all the people who had the new schedule, we'd see that um, on average, people who had the new schedule uh, did a little bit better. Um, and why is it just a little bit better? Because those who were in the uh, new teaching method did a lot better, and those who had the normal teaching method didn't do it any better at all. So if you average a lot better with not better at all, you end up with a little better. You'd find uh, you, uh, a weak main effect of uh, having a changing schedule, and then you'd have a, a, an interaction effect between the two that would explain why you get the we effect in that you've got uh, the effect of new schedule depends on uh, new teaching uh, on level of teaching method. Um, so I know at first this is uh, can be a little bit confusing to uh, to grasp, but it's really useful at trying to figure out how different things. We don't just want to necessarily be knowing, you know, when we're doing a study just about the teaching method. We might want to be knowing, okay, like, do we also need to be taking advantage of it? Do we need to be changing? Uh, 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 the schedule. 
Um, or we might be worried, you know, say, so uh, it might be, I've, I've done survey experiments where I was looking at uh, the effect of kind of the leader's uh, gender on how they were perceived. And one of the things I was interested in was, is there an, also an interaction effect based on their experience? Uh, so is it the case that, you know, maybe, um, for example, I, I kind of uh, hypothesize that, uh, possibly would be that you know men would be whether they're experienced or not experienced would be perceived well as political leaders but women on, uh, only experienced uh women would uh be perceived well um so there kind of be an interaction effect um it how the woman was perceived would depend on their experience or it's also possible that you're gonna have uh, kind of three different levels um, if we assume kind of a, a preference for political leaders, kind of a gender bias where male leaders are, are, are preferred um, and experienced leaders are preferred. So it might have also been the case, you could make a hypothesis that uh, experienced men would be viewed most favorably. And then you'd have as the kind of the second group, you'd have experienced women um, and on the same level as inexperienced men in kind of a second tier. And then the lowest tier would be inexperienced women. So that would be looking at kind of an interaction effect between experience and gender and how people are perceiving them. Um, and so we can gain a lot more experience and understanding. Uh, and this could be important if, for example, um, if, if men tend to have more political experience, um, understanding the effect of experience can also help us understand the effects of uh, gender. So is it that female candidates are viewed worse because um, they're less experienced or because they're women. And so unpacking that um, can help. Uh, just the quick answer um, would also seem based on experience. I mean, Hillary Clinton was extremely experienced, but was viewed uh, negatively. So clearly, um, I, I don't want to uh, make it seem like I, the entire reason that female candidates are viewed worse is lack of experience, because even the really, really experienced ones um, suffer um, problems. Uh, but just kind of stating, you know, this is something that we could test. And so that's where interaction effects would come in. If we're, if we're evaluating, say, how candidates are being evaluated, and we think there's multiple things that could be working kind of together, um, then we can use a factorial design to unpack these things. Um, so you're not always so lucky that you get a two by two. Um, so factorial designs get more complicated, require more groups if different factors take on more than two levels. So, for example, if the school were trying out two new, uh, uh, two new schedules, we would have a three schedule. So we have the old schedule, the first new schedule, and a second new schedule by two teaching methods, normal uh, and uh, new factorial design, which would require six groups, right? Because we've got, we need one that's got uh, the... Uh, old schedule uh, that has the normal teaching method. We've got one that has the old schedule that needs a new teaching method. We need one that has the uh, first new uh, uh, schedule with the uh, old teaching method. We need one that's got the first new schedule with the new teaching method and so on until we reach the end. So um, it what, what could be problematic here for researchers is that if you've got a lot of different levels or you've got a, a, a lot of uh, or multiple factors if you want to be bringing in a, a third. So not just schedule and teaching method, but some other third factor too that you think might be interacting. Um, you could start getting into um, a lot of groups really, really quickly, which in terms of uh, budget or um, access to just having enough individuals who can participate. Uh, so recruiting just an, enough people to have large enough groups um, can be, uh, uh, or you can you get problematic pretty quickly. Uh, types of experiments. So uh, there's a third type uh, called uh, natural experiments, which we're not going to deal with in this class. I uh, just want to briefly mention kind of the, the two most common forms of experiments. So these are, uh, the first are lab experiments. So participants in the experiment coming to the researcher's lab allows the researcher maximum control over the manipulation. Uh, so th those are really good because they, they can, kind of, you could control the social components because you could physically separate the people. You could fully control um, delivery of the instrument because you're delivering it to them. It's not 
you know, they're reading it, but you can deliver the instructions to them. So you can control a lot of things. Uh, critiques to laboratory experiments uh, are often twofold. One is, are they too artificial? So can you generalize? So we haven't talked much about external validity uh, yet, but we introduced it yesterday. So can we, you generalize from it? Um, if it's such an unnatural environment, um, can you draw conclusions for other contexts from lab experiments? The other is, um, so we've talked about random assignment, but there's also random sampling, which is important in terms of, um, so if you want to be drawing conclusions to the wider population, you want a, um, a sample that represents the population. So you want uh, a sample that is as, you know, similar on all characteristics that are important to the wider population. Um, and lab experiments often use convenient samples. Uh, so convenient samples are samples that um, are readily available. When we talk about sampling, we'll talk more about convenient sampling. Um, so one of the most common ones used in research, for example, um, are student samples, because a lot of researchers, they are at colleges and universities. Um, and so they'll recruit and often you know, pay uh, uh, college students. So college students are readily available. Um, college students, as students are also willing to typically accept lower levels of compensation to do something than the, the average population. Um, you, you know, many college students can be paid in things like pizza, um, or uh, whereas, you know, and it's also low cost for the student, particularly say in, in schools where you have a lot of people who live in residence, you know, sticking around school a little bit longer to do a study before going home and home is across the street. Um, even if you didn't have a class right before the study, you know, crossing the street to come back isn't that difficult. Um, so in terms of recruitment and cost, it can be really, really useful. But are students the same as or representative of the wider population? On some questions, they might be. On other questions, they might not be. Um, so that's one concern. Uh, the other concern that you see more with lab experiments. Um, survey experiments. So the experiment is embedded within a survey. So the control and treatment conditions, uh, the text of the survey is identical, except for the manipulation of one portion of the survey in the treatment group. The experiment uh, assesses whether this manipulation affects, it, affects responses to later questions. So essentially you have um, kind of normal surveys in, in many ways, kind of uh, whether they're questionnaires or interviews, and we'll talk more about different types of surveys uh, next time. Uh, and so uh, this could be, uh, and but some people get one version, one people get the other, and it's randomly assigned as to who gets what version. And then we look at whether the differences between the two versions affects the answer to questions. So you might say present a, a lot of them more concerned with something yet. So you present kind of a hypothetical news story or hypothetical scenario. Uh, and then you ask people questions about kind of the response to that scenario. And you look at, does the response to the scenario depend on that characteristic that you changed between the two scenarios? Um, nice things with survey experiments. Um, it, so in both cases, survey and lab experiment, you have a, a random assignment or you can have random assignment. Um, with the survey experiment, it's much easier to get um, random sampling where you have um, kind of a more representative view of, or, or picture, sample, uh, more representative of the wider population. Um, so that's a real nice um, perk. Um, you have a little bit less control in terms of, of both what people complete it, but also um, how seriously are they taking, how much time are they spending on it, what, uh, how clear, closely are they reading the instructions. Um, so that's a little bit of a, uh, a downside there where you could almost, uh, um, so you can't necessarily be sure that everyone's getting the same experience. Um, but uh, in terms of representativeness, um, it has clear advantage. Unfortunately, uh, survey experiments in, aren't always possible. There's certain things that can't be embedded within a survey. Uh, if you need people to be interacting with others, so if it's, uh, an experiment that depends on interaction with another person uh, or another uh, experiment participant that's not going to be as, as possible in, in, a, in a survey experiment. 
Um, so you would need people to be coming to lab. There's also just, you know, certain uh, scenarios that require uh, lab equipment or stuff like that, which couldn't be done in a survey context. But if it is the type of experiment that can be put into a survey, that has a lot of different advantages. You could mail it to the person, you could give it online, you could give it by phone. So a survey experiment about gender might present a scenario about the behavior of an individual. The scenarios in the treatment and control group will be identical except for the gender of the individual. The experimenter then examines whether participants in each group responded differently to the scenario. So you have a female candidate, male candidate, and then they're asked to assess you know, how trustworthy is the candidate, how competent is the candidate, are you likely to vote for the candidate, how well do you think they'll handle economic issues, how well do you think you'll handle social issues, how well do you think they'll handle military issues, and then you can pick the only difference between the candidate's profile was the gender, and then you're able to say, okay, any differences that we see in the responses um, are be therefore because of gender biases. Uh, survey experiments can be delivered face-to-face, -face, by phone, by mail, or on the internet, giving them a high degree of flexibility. All right, so introduction to non-experimental research. Uh, so here we're going to talk more about kind of, um, there's a whole bunch of different types of non-experimental uh, research. And here we're kind of jumbling in kind of quasi-experimental with non-experimental. Um, but I want to just focus on a few different types or categories of, um, of uh, kind of observational research. Um, because some of you will be choosing this, and certainly in most of you will be doing non-experimental uh, research when you do eventually get to IFSS. Most of the research papers you write in university will be non-experimental, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about those. Um, also, in this class, uh, many, some of you may choose to implement a survey experiment, but many of you may be interested in issues that where a survey experiment wouldn't be appropriate, or you're interested in the characteristics, say the role of difference between men and women. You can't manipulate men and women, so you're not doing an experiment there. Um, so, you, and you still might be interested though in making, what is the effect? Is there a cause or effect of, uh, uh, of gender? So you don't want to just be doing kind of a, uh, a correlational study. So talk a little bit about, is it possible with non-experimental research to be looking at cause? Um, uh, certainly, there'd be a lot greater weakness because of less control over the threats to validity. So, but is it still possible to do? And kind of what are kind of the, some of the broad categories that we have in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, non-experimental work. So non-experimental methods in many situations in the social sciences, the researcher has no ability to manipulate the treatment. Um, so I can't create a war. Um, I probably can't even create a, you know, a, a, a tax cuts. Um, uh, so there's just so many things uh, in the social world that we, we just can't manipulate um, for ethical or practical or cost reasons. So we, we can't do an experiment as much as we'd like to. And there's a lot of experimental work that tries to figure out, okay, so I can't create a war, but can I create uh, some of the conditions that are associated with war so I can kind of get at how we get to war. So can I see how people respond to conflict? Because uh, you can create some form of potentially conflict, not violent conflict, but uh, or, um, if you can create a conflictual situation. So there's people are trying to get creative at looking at kind of, okay, so we can't create war, but can we create some of the components that lead into war to see, to do experiments there? Um, or I can manipulate some of those. Um, but still most studies in most of the social issues an experiment's not possible. Um, so yeah, it would be neither feasible nor ethical for a researcher to randomly assign countries to war. Um, in order to overcome these situations, researchers um, often try to make causal inferences from observational data. Um, so it's ones where observational data, meaning that uh, we uh, just observe stuff, we weren't able to manipulate it. So you might do a survey and you're interested in uh, say, uh, how different racial groups uh, uh, respond to something or how people with different uh, 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 social views and you weren't able to manipulate those social views, how people with different social views or uh, economic situations respond to something. You weren't able to manipulate any of those, you're just observing um, 
how they respond to different things. It might be that uh, you want to find out what was the cause of a specific event in history. And so you're just looking at that event in history and you're observing kind of what were the facts and seeing uh, if you can uncover the causes. It might be that you're interested in, again, something um, that's going on in the world, it's something you can't manipulate. Uh, and so you're just looking at the data across different countries or across different regions or across different cities and saying, can we find a pattern and can we, uh, for what's causing that, uh, it's all, uh, see, you know, what was the impact of tax cuts? So I can't create a tax cut. So let's look at across time or across space, what happens after a tax cut. Uh, so uh, all the places that had a tax cut recently versus all the places that didn't have a tax cut, all of those who implemented a fixed exchange rate versus uh, non-fixed exchange rate and see, um, did these choices after the financial crisis, all of those who uh, reduced interest rates for, didn't introduce uh, reduced interest rates uh, for COVID. If we want to understand uh, why we got big outbreaks, those who implemented social distancing versus those that didn't implement social distancing. Again, we can't manipulate, but we can observe and compare across different countries or regions um, or cities and see, okay, the cities that had really implemented social distancing, they were able to flatten in the curve. Those that didn't, um, so we can't manipulate those things, but we can try, hopefully, the, the goal often, it, we could certainly find relational to correlations, uh, but also some of the goals sometimes is try to make causal inference and then see, did social distancing cause a more likely to lead to, uh, a, not just a correlation with, uh, say, uh, lower, uh, smaller size outbreaks, but also produced, led to cause smaller size outbreaks. And that would be a goal that we have, and we'd be doing that through observation research. So non-experimental methods um, are often divided um, based on uh, uh, the uh, number of observations that you're looking at. So uh, these aren't methods in themselves. Um, uh, these are more in terms of how you're selecting your sample. Uh, so we talked about when we're defining methods, uh, selection of sample is important or who are the participants. Uh, and so uh, case studies are focusing or sampling a uh, perhaps small number of participants and large end studies, and standing for number studies uh, have, and there's multiple families of, of each of these or multiple designs of each of these. But they're, these are so, that's why I'm saying they're families um, of non-experimental methods. So large end would have a large number of participants. So yeah, di a difference is in the number of observations. Case studies focus on a small number. Uh, there's no set cutoff between where you get the large end and small end, but most case studies are doing one, two, uh, possibly three. Uh, uh, you could also call it small n. Uh, and case study then just would just mean one, and comparative case study could be two or three. Uh, but uh, uh, the difference being so small in our case studies, you're going in depth on a small number and possibly comparing them if you got more than one. And then large n is comparing a large number. It could, very, it could be very, very strong for descriptive and relational studies, particularly large n can be, uh, uh, case, uh, uh, case studies can be extremely strong for description. Uh, and it's large n too, depending on what you're trying to describe. But if you're trying to describe, for example, what happened, case studies can be extremely, extremely um, strong. Uh, and large n tends to be particularly strong for relational studies for finding correlation. Uh, there are concerns with both, with all non-experimental methods in terms of internal validity. So in terms of making, uh, establishing causation. Um, so it can try to overcome them by focusing on causal process. So looking, you know, if the hypothesis that, uh, or the theory says this leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. Um, and so there's a sequence of events that are supposed to happen. Um, the non-experimental method could try to see, do we see all of the steps? that uh, the uh, theory predicted, do we see all of those? And uh, you could even look, say, in a case study, look at decision-making, see you know, what factors did the person who was making the decision seem to be weighing, and does that fit with the theory? Um, and eliminate alternative hypotheses. So you always have to be able to establish causation 
be able to eliminate alternative hypotheses. And so both of these uh, kind of families will adopt different methods for trying to eliminate alternative hypotheses. And remember, many of the alternative hypotheses, so it's not saying that there's no other causes. Uh, it's more trying to say in terms of the threats to validity. So it's uh, trying to uh, eliminate all history threats to validity, trying to eliminate all of the maturation threats to validity, trying to eliminate all the testing threats to validity, all the alternative explanations that could explain our finding. So in large end studies, um, when we're talking about causation, uh, the observer compares the outcomes in many cases in order to determine whether the outcome differs based on whether the treatment variable is present. So uh, now treatment in this case is not manipulated. Uh, so you more say it in terms of independent variable. So in the correlational study in large end, you'd be looking at, okay, if you know this is present, are we more likely to see this other thing? So if uh, we have low interest rates, are we more likely to see um, uh, uh, higher consumer spending. Uh, so large N is most frequently done for uh, relational or for finding correlation. But many researchers also want to use it as part of kind of theory testing for trying to test explanations, um, which uh, so then you need to try to be eliminating. So you've got the correlation. It, you may be able to set up temporal precedent, so showing that the interest rate type came before the increase in spending. Uh, so temporal precedent, it's eliminating the alternative hypotheses. Uh, that is the most problematic here. Um, so that needs to be done either through theory, um, through careful design. Um, oftentimes it's done through analysis. Um, there's increasing efforts to try to do it through design. Often it's done through analysis. It's not particularly satisfying most of the time. Um, I, I think the most important thing, because many of you are going to be doing probably with your survey a version of a large N, and since you're trying to answer a question and you're probably going to be trying to say that something explains something else, the most important thing is honesty, right? It's saying that, you know, we've shown that there's a correlation, uh, we've shown that there's temporal precedence, um, that fits the theory, but it doesn't prove causation. Right, being honest that the evidence supports what we would expect to see, but it's not conclusive because of these threats. Um, so we can't make a strong causal claim. All we can say is that the correlation and the temporal precedence, uh, really the correlation, uh, we have temporal precedence and the correlation fits. So as long as you're honest in that way, there's nothing wrong with those studies. It doesn't, um, you know, it, it doesn't allow for you know, uh, a strong, it, it's not as strong of a test. Um, but if you're able to say, repeat the same thing, if you've got 20 different tests, um, all of them are finding the same thing across different uh, observational studies, then you could start saying, okay, you know, over time, maybe we start coming to the conclusion that this is causal. Um, because over time with so many different tests, you know, uh, you know you're not gonna have always the same threats. Um, uh, so, for example, if a researcher wants to learn whether democracy leads to economic development, the researcher might gather data on regime type and economic development for every country and compare whether democracies have a higher level of development. Uh, so, that's, so we essentially would be looking at does regime type cause economic development? The problem here is, so we've got multiple groups. Uh, so, uh, so, so that's good in terms of your sing, uh, single group threat to validity. We've got some more democracies and some who are not democracy. So that's good in terms of single threat, but we've got all kinds of threats, uh, multi-group threats to validity, right? Because countries aren't randomly assigned to being democracies and not democracies. And not dem uh, democracies and non-democracies differ on so many different characteristics, all of which could lead to different levels of economic development. So you've got, we've got a problem in terms of selection. So countries that became democracies or probably were already different from those who stayed as non-democracies. So you've got that already a difference and then democracies probably and non-democracies probably continue to evolve and differ in many different ways going through different histories and different maturation, uh, all kinds of different things. Uh, 
that could be leading to different levels of economic development. Uh, so in terms of making causal claims, we'd be very worried. Uh, so again, partial, so saying the correlation fits the theory, and that's still something, that's still really good progress. Um, it's a correlational study, it's not a causal study, um, but it still can let, lend some support to the theory. Uh, in case studies, the observer examines what happened in one or small number of cases to determine whether the presence of the treatment produces the outcome. Um, in these studies, there's a, uh, often, a, uh, often a greater focus on uh, how the cause produces the effect, the mechanism. So does uh, part one lead to part two, lead to part three, lead to part four, or step one lead to step two, lead to step three, lead to step four. Uh, so, for example, if a researcher wants to learn whether the 2003 Iraq war was really about the pursuit of oil, a researcher might uh, examine government documents and conduct interviews with those involved in making decisions, look at the bio autobiographies uh, in order to determine what factors were discussed and motivated the decision. Um, so there's two different kind of versions here that you, you see commonly, uh, and both have different advantages in terms of um, dealing with uh, internal threats to validity. So you could just have, in this case, a single case study. Um, so um, we, you could get in depth on kind of the causal mechanism, um, which is really good. So you can get in depth and see, you know, the, what factors exactly led here. Um, but it's a single group. So you have those single group threats uh, to uh, validity. Right, so you, you don't know what would have happened because you don't have a comparison group. Um, you don't know um, what would have happened um, if you had uh, removed that, that factor, right? What if there was uh, no oil in Iraq? Um, would have they come to the same decision? Um, uh, so, you don't have another group for comparison purposes. Um, so that's definitely a problem, but you can get really in depth and look at the mechanism. Um, but you've got all of those kind of single group threats of validity problems. The other version um, is a, uh, what's called a, a comparative case study where you're comparing two groups. So uh, there you have kind of a control and a treatment group. So you could have uh, situations where there is, uh, uh, war in uh, oil in one country and oil in not another. Um, you do have a lot though in this case, so you've kind of solved some of the internal threat to validity, but you've got a whole bunch of uh, multiple group threat to validity because the questions then become are, are these two cases, are they comparable, right? Or is, is the group making decisions in that, in, in your treatment group, the same as the, those who are comparable to those who are making decisions? Because your other case is either going to be in another country, or it's going to be in another time period, or it's going to be with another different government. And so there's all kinds of different ways um, that these groups could be different. And one of those group differences could be lead to different outcomes. Um, how do, um, uh, so some of the ways of trying to deal with this um, in term for uh, large end studies often use what are called control variables. Uh, and there's different ways that they're going to do it. Um, in QM, you don't get to kind of the level of statistics where um, introducing control variables would be something that's possible for you in terms of uh, either design or analysis. Um, so this is something I'm just going to introduce really, really briefly. Um, but kind of the concept of introducing control. So in social science discussion of observational studies, a control is a variable that's introduced statistically into the analysis. Um, it also actually can be sometimes introduced into the design, um, uh, but you, uh, usually in terms of how in practice, it's usually introduced into the analysis with the goal of removing um, its effect on relationships among two or more other variables. Statistical control with observational data is concerned with eliminating alternative hypotheses, right? So it's essentially all of these different kind of like history effect or, or um, kind of difference between uh, the groups um, that can cause a kind of multi-group. Um, we've got, uh, you've got usually the two groups. 
um, you got your treatment uh, in, in these studies. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to get rid of the multi-group threats, right? Because your two groups aren't the same. So we use control variables to try to eliminate alternative hypotheses by making the groups as same as possible. Um, in practice, it's important to note that the control of variables in observational studies does not overcome threats to internal validity. They can improve them, um, they can make the situation better, um, but they're not, um, so they're certainly an improvement on not using them. But um, some particular observational researchers will claim that they essentially do the same thing as they mimic experimentation. So they allow you to make the same types of claims that you, you can make after kind of using experiment, uh, that they eliminate uh, threats to internal validity the same way could, by eliminating all our ten hypotheses. That's not true. Um, statistically, they're not equivalent. Uh, and so you cannot make the same level of causal claims. Um, it, uh, you can make possibly weak causal claims. Um, but again, I, when you're dealing with observational data, your best approach is to try to design it as well as possible. Be honest that what you're doing is a relational study and just say whether, remember, part of causation is finding correlation. So if you're able to get temporal precedence and correlation, you've still done really, really good in terms of it's not a full causal claim, but you've still advanced knowledge. And being honest about that and just saying this fits with the theory, we've improved our understanding of the theory, um, but you're not able to definitively say cause, um, it, that's still a really good contribution. Uh, causal claims uh, process tracing um, is, so process tracing is one of the uh, methods used in case studies. Uh, there's multiple different ways of doing case studies, um, but uh, one of the kind of the popular forms is process tracing, and it's to try to improve the ability to um, make causal claims from case studies. So process tracing involves the examination of diagnostic pieces of evidence within a case that contribute to supporting or overturning alternative explanatory hypotheses. The central concern is with the sequences and mechanisms in the unfolding of hypothesized causal processes. The researcher looks for the observable implications of hypothesized explanations. The goal is to establish whether the events or processes within the case fit those predicted by alternative explanations, right? So, uh, for example, say you're trying to test, uh, so one of the common used ones in, in looking at process tracing and the different types of tests you could do would be, so for example, you're trying to uh, do a case study on a crime and figure out if somebody is guilty, right? And so the main hypothesis would be kind of the, the, the uh, hypothesis that you're testing or the theory that you have is uh, that the, 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 the accused is guilty uh, and the uh, uh, the kind of, so that your null hypothesis would be that they're not guilty, right? So some of the things you could be looking at is, you know, um, was the person uh, present, like was the person in the city at the time the crime occurred? The person that's not in the city at the time occurred, well, you've eliminated, uh, the, the hypothesis is, is found to be incorrect. Now, you haven't proven it, but you've proved, produced evidence that's necessary. Right, so it, it hasn't fully shown it, but you've found evidence that at least is necessary. It's not sufficient to, to make the claim, but it's uh, it's necessary. Um, could be that uh, could be that you you investigate and you found that uh, the two people knew each other well. Uh, that's not necessary, right? You could have random crime where uh, a crime occurs. Let's say the crime was a murder and uh, the murderer randomly when the two don't know each other so that happens uh, a lot but it's a the two, you can find that the two knew each other and they had a, a fight recently well a lot of murder and a lot of crime ends up being between people who know each other so it increases the kind of likelihood and it starts going towards establishing motive so it's not necessary information right but if you get a lot of that type of information it still still starts building the case um, you could look for evidence of you know the person being found holding the murder weapon. Now you didn't see them doing uh, the crime, but if you cut, if, if they got found to be holding it af right after uh, the crime occurred, well, that's really strong evidence of it. Uh, it's 
uh, it's not necessary, um, but it's probably sufficient for most people to believe the person did it. It's not necessary in that the person could do it and you didn't find uh, them holding it. So essentially, you'd be looking at evidence in terms of the sequence. So the person, uh, uh, in a lot of kind of decision making ones, uh, it says to say decision making, you kind of look at the different steps in the process of how they went through the lead up to the decision. And did the lead up, did the things that they did and the things they discussed and the things they reasoned about um, fit? So, for example, if the Iraq War uh, one, and for the argument that it's really about oil, if we had full access to all the discussions that took place in the lead up to the 2003 Iraq War, and we found that nobody in the administration ever once discussed oil, then you know, it'd be very hard to say that claim uh, is supported. So we'd be going through kind of, you'd go through all of those kind of different discussions and see the tests and, and finding, are you finding uh, information? So diagnostic pieces of evidence that either that are necessary or sufficient, um, or even if they're not necessary or sufficient, but you can get a lot of it, but that really help um, because they shed light on things that we would expect to see if the hypothesis is correct. And so we try to eliminate alternative hypotheses uh, and uh, find things that would support the hypothesis conclusion. By identifying the causal mechanism, how they, the cause produced uh, the effect, process tracing can provide strong causal evidence. However, concern about internal validity may remain because process tracing does not allow us to see the counterfactual situation. So um, we're still not going to ever be seeing uh, what happens if you know you change the treatment. Um, that, that's never possible. Um, so because we're never seeing the counterfactual situation, it's still generally quite difficult. Um, again, unless you find that smoking gun of like you have video evidence of the person committing the crime, uh, committing the murder, uh, unless you get kind of that really uh, strong evidence, uh, uh, because you don't have the counterfactual, you're still going to have some threat to internal validity. Um, but a really good process tracing can actually be very, very, very strong in terms of showing cause. Uh, and so we didn't really talk about post-positivist research um, and ethnography isn't necessarily used only in uh, post-positivist research. Uh, so post-positivist, so um, our research will tend to be ones that hold different kind of philosophical uh, positions, uh, in particular, a lot of having to do with um, objectivity of the uh, researcher, so can the um, uh, observer be, so can the researcher be objective in, uh, in their observations? Um, and most positive research kind of assumes that yes, the scientist can be uh, objective, um, where most, a lot of post positive research would uh, question the ability of the researcher to be objective. So saying that all knowledge created is subjective. Um, and so um, it's different positions on what science can do or often what even science should do um, and what are the different methodologies that we should go about uh, or we should use. Uh, and ethnography um, is a, a qualitative uh, method that is frequently used in post-positive research. It's also used in, in some positive research. Uh, and ethnography means study of a culture using qualitative field research. So going out into the field so not just kind of looking at books or reports or articles on how the culture is behave or pe people in the culture behave, um, but actually going out and seeing it for yourself, going out into the field. Uh, two uh, common types, so participant observation. So the ethnographer becomes immersed in the culture as an active participant and records extensive field notes. So the person goes out and just essentially joins. So like, uh, say you want to be learning about a culture across the world, you go out there and you don't just observe, but you participate, you try to take on the local, you learn the local language, you learn the local customs, and you start behaving according to those local customs, and you take notes on kind of what it means and the experience. And then naturalistic observation, so again, you go, but the uh, ethnographer observes the culture in its natural context without becoming an active participant. 
participant in the culture, right? So you don't start behaving necessarily according to the culture. Now, in most cases, particularly uh, when we're, we talked about studying um, other cultures, it's hard to um, not start becoming participant observer. Uh, uh, like if you move to another region of the world, um, you're probably just out of almost necessity going to start taking on some level of um, behavior that fits with the, the culture you're living in. Um, but the idea in naturalistic observation would try to maintain your separation at most. So in terms of ethnography or field research, it would be the, the, the form that uh, uh, would be more on the positivist side. Um, all right, so that's it uh, for uh, this class. And next time we'll be uh, uh, moving on to a, a little bit of survey research and uh, some a few other topics. So have a great day.